I'm now honored to turn the evening over to another incredible leader, uh, former FDA commissioner, former CN administrator, and director of the Duke Margolis Center, uh, Dr. Mark McClellan. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be part of this evening. And uh, let me add to the congratulations for 25 years of friends, uh, Ellen, Jeff, the entire friends team doing critical work in support of the advancement of science that makes a real difference for patients. And that includes critical support for the mission of the Food and Drug Administration. This is a time when we really see how important it is to have such a strong science-based agency supporting the, the nation's public health. And I'm very pleased in turn to be here with uh, not only you, but two of those FDA veterans whose work is so important to the nation right now. Dr. Janet Woodcock, who's been the director of FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and advisor to the commission who's now overseeing therapeutics for Operation Warp Speed, and Peter Marks, the director of FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, which is right at the center uh, of that process on getting to safe and effective vaccines that you just heard so much about from Dr. Fauci. Um, Janet, I'd like to start with a few questions for you tonight. Um, can you help us get past the name Operation Warp Speed and and talk about what Operation Warp Speed is doing? And you know we we're going we've talked about and we're going to talk more about vaccines in a few minutes. But why the focus that you're leading on therapeutics and preventive treatments is also really important. Well, first of all, I'd like to say I feel really comfortable with what I'm doing. I think it's the right thing to do. And if you think about it. A government, people would expect their government to try and help them uh, develop treatments as well as vaccines and to do that in the most effective way possible. And that's really what we're doing. Operation Warp Speed is looking at developing treatments and preventives as well as vaccines. And it's helping them move faster by putting those resources against the development as Dr. Fauci said, not only the manufacturing, which usually comes later and takes longer, uh, but also the clinical trials, bolstering up those clinical trials, helping um, you know, get the patients in, doing everything possible to get these evaluated as quickly as possible. So that's, that's what Operation Warp Speed is doing. And of course, we had to pick out for treatments and preventives, we had to pick out the most promising uh, therapeutics to focus on because there's a huge range of them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of those therapeutics that you're prioritizing, um, any that you'd particularly like to highlight? You know, this has been such a complex disease. It's been hard to find a silver bullet, uh, even if vaccines are effective. You know, there are lots of people who aren't able to, to mount a good uh, immune response. What kinds of therapeutics are you uh, focusing on right now? Well, from the beginning of starting Operation Warp Speed Therapeutics, we focus on antiviral compounds. And uh, one of those is the antibody therapy. So we want vaccines to make antibodies, but if you don't have a vaccine, uh, maybe we can give you antibodies and prevent you from getting the uh, virus or treat you if you have it. And um, those monoclonal antibodies and other types of antibodies are looking like they you know, are very, very promising. We just had an announcement today from Regeneron that their early trial in people who were not yet hospitalized showed that giving them an antibody cocktail, like two antibodies together, um, decreased their virus, shortened their illness, and, and, um, and so forth. And so these are the early signs, in fact, that uh, not only that antibodies may work, and are very promising, but that vaccines are going to work because, um, you know, you, we've showed that antibodies can actually have an impact on the disease. And Lilly also, which is another uh, manufacturer working with Operation Warp Speed, also announced uh, a little while ago that they, they their early trial showed that um, possibly they can decrease hospitalizations, uh, especially of people at high risk when they give them an antibody infusion. So we're working on that. We're working on antiviral compounds, in other words, pills <laughs> that you can take, all right, that uh, fight the virus, and also then 
a lot of late stage uh, treatments or managing the complications like anticoagulants and things to deal with the severe cases where people are on the ventilator. So I think there's a lot of promise and hope. Uh, the, uh, there's been a great deal of improvement in the management of people once they're sick with uh, COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic and the number of people who are dying is going down. And I think we can really make an impact on that. And I also think we can probably treat people who aren't in the hospital in, in ways uh, that prevent them from getting seriously ill until which time we get everybody vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's all good to hear. Can you say a little bit more about the, the process that you're going through and how you're getting that kind of acceleration or rapid pace without cutting corners. Uh, for example, you mentioned in the monoclonal antibody studies reported today, those were, I think you said, early stage results. So they showed that people had an immune response, uh, maybe some suggestive findings on uh, maybe reducing uh, severity of disease, but but you're looking for more, right? There, there are larger clinical trials coming. And, and can you say what you're doing to make that process go as quickly as feasible without cutting corners? Sure, we're working with the manufacturers, obviously, uh, and they're doing some of their own trials, but we're also working with the active group in NIH and NAID to have some very large, what are called master protocols. And these are protocols or clinical trials that can test more than one product. And so they can share a control group. That sounds very strange, but <laughs> if you're not into this, but um, they, it's more efficient, but no corners are cut there. And the plan is both for inpatients and outpatients, we have these master protocols and we plan to test multiple agents. And we're putting government resources into that so we can make those trials as large as possible enroll as many people as possible, which is a very good thing to do uh, anyway, but that will get us the data that we need to show whether or not these uh, work well enough and how safe they are. And, and doing it as quickly as possible by enrolling more patients in this master kind of standard approach. How are we doing on implementing those, those protocols, Janet? I mean, it does seem like even with the efforts underway at warp speed, you know, this country is the number one supplier of uh, COVID-19 cases in the world. And just as in so many other areas of biomedical research, it seems like the vast majority of people aren't making it into to clinical trials where we really do have important questions to answer. Uh, are, are there things that we can do now beyond the pandemic to, to, to enable us to learn more faster? I think um, that we need to do some very serious soul searching after this is over. Uh, right now, the situation with uh, clinical trials for this disease is like starvation in the midst of plenty. Um, there are competition for patients at major medical centers, and yet people are being are sick and dying all over the country, and they don't have access to clinical trials. So. Uh, also, there's a large number of trials going on that are not going to yield actionable data. From FDA, we've looked at this and we think only about 6% of all the trials that are trial arms that are going on will yield actionable data because most okay, many sorry, of them are so, so we're in the midst of a pandemic and 6% uh, of all of these hundreds of trials that are underway, that's all we expect to get meaningful results out of? That is correct. They're either they're not randomized, and so we won't be able to draw firm conclusions, or they're underpowered. And as I said, they're under enrolling. They aren't enrolling enough patients, and so we have these very small trials. And I think we really need to think about how we have a much more robust, um, standardized process in the United States for gathering clinical evidence. Yeah, you know, sounds like a really important topic for friends, for all of us to work on. I know uh, friends has tried to bring that pro master protocol concept to uh, oncology, but uh, boy, right. we could sure use it now. Um, Janet, thanks for taking the time with us. Be before um, I turn to Peter, I do want to ask you, you you've been at FDA for literally decades. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember us having a lot of discussions about very tough issues, including uh, SARS, coronavirus, back in, in 2003. Um, 
there's been a lot of discussion lately about uh, questions about whether FDA is going to to, to uh, be able to act appropriately with we're in a political season, lots of pressure on the agency. Um, what are your thoughts about this, having having been there and having so much experience at FDA? I have absolute confidence that they're going to do the right thing. I have no concerns about that. These are professional staff. They've been in many, many uh, controversial situations, and they apply their best scientific judgment. We have experienced virologists, infectious disease docs, pharmacologists, you name it, the manufacturing people. They're going to do the right thing, and I think we can rely upon them to render the correct judgments. Janet, thanks for all you're doing. I want to turn now to uh, discussing some of these important issues about vaccines with Peter Marks. Before I do, though, I, I want to just add to, to Janet's comments about the professionalism, the expertise, the well-established support systems that the FDA has put in place for decades to make sure yes. uh, that we do the right thing at for science at critical times like this. And I just want to point out to all of you that uh, this doesn't happen all that often, but along with six other former FDA commissioners, from David Kessler through Scott Gottlieb through five administrations in three decades, uh, we just wrote an op-ed that's up at the Washington Post now, be out tomorrow, highlighting the importance of avoiding political interference in FDA science-based processes. But the other key point in that op-ed is that just like you heard from Janet, we all have full confidence in that vaccine development is on track, for all of the kinds of reasons that you've heard tonight from Janet, from Tony Fauci earlier. Uh, so Janet, uh, thank you for all you're doing to get the FDA in this position. We're really lucky to have the agency right now. And uh, Peter, uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, to turn to you to talk a little bit more about where we're headed with vaccine development from here. Tony uh, provided some overview of, of what may happen next. And he talked about the usual full approval of a vaccine, so the full FDA uh, regulatory review and so forth, and also about an emergency use authorization, uh, uh, a, uh, an authority that FDA has that was actually created for public health emergencies uh, like this one. Can you talk a little bit about why, an FDA, why the FDA might be considering an emergency use authorization for a vaccine right now? Right. So those who are uh, are essentially throwing uh, around the term that you have to have a biologics license application uh, and you shouldn't use an emergency use authorization in this kind of setting of the vaccine, they simply don't understand the nature of a biologics license application for a vaccine. Um, that they underestimate what goes into these. Um, a biologics license application is essentially a blueprint for everything from the manufacturing to the manufacturing facilities uh, to everything about that vaccine that we uh, can get from the manufacturer. And they tend to be uh, documents that can be not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of pages long. And um, they uh, take a long time to put together, you can imagine, to put that all together. And they actually take a long time for us to review. Now, they are what we should have as the gold standard because we must have confidence in the vaccines uh, that are, are approved in this country. Um, they need to be quality vaccines that are safe and effective. But in a time of a pandemic, I think this, uh, what Congress gave us was the ability to use emergency use authorization. Um, now we use that in different settings. We use that for therapeutic products where they're being used to treat patients who have a disease. And the standard was set at a lower bar uh, than our typical um, substantial evidence of effectiveness standard. It was set, set at the product uh, may be effective um, and that the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. But for a vaccine, um, we're going to be using an emergency use authorization in a different way than that. We're going to be using it really as a way of ensuring that a vaccine has the proper information that makes us feel confident that it's going to do what it can do and what it should do, uh, which is help prevent disease uh, and uh, 
the idea here is to have uh, the data that will go into um, uh, our emergency use authorization, if that's what we decide to, the action we decide to undertake, um, will need to come from a well-designed, large phase three trial uh, that shows clear and compelling efficacy of the vaccine. And with that in hand, we would feel comfortable using an emergency use authorization uh, to allow us to move forward more quickly on the key elements uh, that will potentially save lives. Yes, it would be nice to have all of the bells and whistles that we normally have uh, for a biologics license application. Uh, but what we may lack in terms of some of the safety data in terms of length of follow-up, we intend to make up through enhanced pharmacovigilance, that's enhanced safety monitoring after the vaccine is put out there. Um, and we have to balance this crucially against the following. Every day, a thousand or more people are dying in this country. From everything I see, um, and I'll obviously defer to those more knowledgeable like the Dr. Fauci's of the world, things aren't getting better right now. They're in the wrong direction. So we have to balance um, this need to perhaps have the most certainty we could about safety with the need to get something to people uh, that is safe to, to everything we can see and effective uh, uh, that will potentially help bring this under control. And the, the idea of waiting months for somebody to put together a license application and us to review it when uh, potentially uh, we could have uh, the application of a safe and effective vaccine uh, that, that would be, I think, not a good public health maneuver. Thanks, Peter. And does that, it sounds like um, in terms of, for practical purposes, the safety and effectiveness standard that you're talking about here may be different, perhaps in the length of safety follow-up, which you said you're going to make up for with additional, something you have authority to do under the emergency use authorization, additional data collection. Does that mean the vaccine uh, along the lines of what Dr. Fauci was talking about might first be uh, made available under the authorization for higher risk groups, or, or how do you see that unfolding? Yeah, I think I think we're going to look at the data. I I I, I don't want to say I, who it's going to be made available to because that may be more of a decision by the uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's advisory committee on immunization practices. It may be that the manufacturers come in with data that allow us to provide a relatively broad label for the vaccine. But it may be that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices feels that it should be first deployed in certain populations. And obviously, whatever population it's deployed in, we will gather as much safety information as we possibly can. We'll probably also be looking at efficacy information as well using large databases such as the Sentinel system and a related system called BEST, which not only accesses claims, but also can access the electronic medical records for a subset of those claims. Mm -hmm. And Peter, FDA's guidance uh, on this whole emergency use and, and other processes related to the vaccine has been in the news uh, a lot these days uh, with some questions about whether the guidance that the agency has reportedly drafted related to emergency use authorization for COVID vaccines is actually going to be released. Now, um, from my experience, guidance is usually, is generally something that industry wants, that the public wants for more clarity about the guidance that you're providing for industry. But you've been providing ongoing guidance throughout this whole process to vaccine developers. Could you talk a little bit about the key things in the guidance that you've provided to companies developing vaccines as we look yeah. forward from here? Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, this, this, uh, the reason why there's no reason to, there's, there's no there there about this guidance to get all excited. The, the, the companies know what we were expecting. Um, this guidance was being done. The most important thing that I think I can do and I can help do in the coming months is to help generate trust, regain trust in vaccines. Vaccines have saved public health previously. They will save it again. Um, we just are going to have to believe in them. And, and so anything we can do to help 
um, and, and gender trust in the process is critical. So this guidance was an attempt to help the public see what we were requiring of uh, COVID-19 vaccines so that they understood that, I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna be careful to say this, but in, in many ways, much of what we're doing here is these vaccines need to be the moral equivalent of, of getting as close as we could if they're given under emergency use authorization of, of what we would like to see from a licensed vaccine, yet they're not quite licensed, okay? So they're getting close. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the guidance was trying to explain that, um, explain what we expe expected, and to reassure the public that we were gonna have a transparent advisory committee meeting for each and every emergency use authorization that comes through so that people understand that they'll be able to hear these vaccines presented. They'll be able to hear experts discussing them. They'll be able to get the materials um, that uh, are, are submitted by the company and that the FDA puts forth uh, about these vaccines. So among other things and the guidance that you're providing to companies uh, with that goal in mind of uh, safety and effectiveness, and as you said, close as possible to a full approval, that would include seeing the trials go through to their hard clinical endpoints on reducing infections and also reducing serious infections, that would be in there? That would um, certainly be in there, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, collection of a lot, a big database on safety in these large uh, tens of thousands of patients who are getting, um, uh, who are in the studies for, uh, say, a couple of months or, or potentially longer after uh, their vaccine doses. Uh, that would certainly be, that was already in our guidance that we put out yeah. earlier on these. So we we, we are going to have um, large databases here of, of patients. Um, you know, typically our vaccines have had somewhere between 8,000 and 160,000 person years of follow-up when a BLA is, um, is issued. Now here, it'll probably be, uh, if we if do an emergency use authorization, it'll probably be a quarter or, or possibly it, it could be even a half of that, a quarter to a half of this. Um, so the person years of follow-up won't be quite as large to start, but we, we have these excellent surveillance systems and that's something that's really come along in the past five to 10 years. That's not something that we had back in 1976 with swine flu and we yeah. certainly didn't have it back um, in the 50s. So these are, uh, these are really um, systems that can help us. We know they can detect signals uh, from previous experience. Um, and so uh, we'll use those to the fullest extent. Again, I'm not trying to falsely reassure anyone because could, you know, there, we have to be always be cautious when uh, we're approving products because that's what we're paid to be. We're paid to be cautious and to really care about the health of the American people for vaccines and make sure they're safe uh, and effective and do what they're supposed to do. Um, but we also have to balance the fact that I would, you know, for, you know to, to remove every last doubt possible um, could also lead to loss of life if we require the bar to be so high um, that we uh, that we you know follow and dog down every last possible uh, adverse event to the last possible time, um, uh, particularly if the vaccine has a very good safety profile overall. Otherwise, mm -hmm. not said in the most elegant way, but the bottom line is we're going to do our job to make sure that we do the right benefit risk calculation uh, so that a safe, effective quality vaccine gets out there um, uh, to help people as soon as it possibly can. And before there's an FDA decision, as you said, there's gonna be a meeting for each of these vaccines with that public independent, a public meeting with that independent advisory committee with a chance for FDA to comment in writing about everything they've seen on the vaccine all and all that discussion is a basis before any written FDA decision about a vaccine. I, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to meet. It may not make every, the maybe not every. writing, TV watching is some other things, but um, we intend to webcast this. Um, there will be an open public hearing. I suspect that there'll be some academics that will have opinions about the safety or efficacy of the vaccine, and they'll say them. 
Um, there may be others that have opinion about the vaccine, but that dialogue is very important. Uh, and our ability to have this public process is very important because at the end of the day, we need people to have trust in this. And that's why I'm very thankful to you and the other uh, six commissioners um, uh, who, who have put together uh, uh, this editorial of support. We need to come together as a scientific community. We need to let our differences aside and come together to really have trust in the power of safe and effective vaccines. Um, they eliminated smallpox from this earth. They've basically, uh, if people would actually take the vaccines, have eliminated measles and polio um, and, and several other infectious diseases from our shores. We can do this. We can. But we really have to just come together as a scientific and medical community um, and, and, and regain the trust uh, of people um, in the vaccine. Well, Peter, I really appreciate the clear guidance you're providing about uh, the, the scientific basis and the public and transparent basis for doing that. I uh, uh, want to thank both of you for all you're doing. We've run a little bit over. This was a really interesting discussion. I appreciate you taking the extra time. If I could ask just uh, one last quick question. Um, uh, how are you all hanging in there? This is really hard work. It's uh, in the public eye. Uh, uh, what's getting you through it? Are you doing okay? Thank you. I'm doing okay. It's one foot in front of the other, Mark. <laughs> Peter, you too? I'm doing wonderfully. And you know, I, I took my uh, my lesson from someone said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. I have a wonderful dog. He <laughs> takes good care of me. I'm doing okay. <laughs> That's great. And, and you all have a wonderful, wonderful teams working with you. Uh, um, just to close out, thank you all for the service that you're providing to the country. Um, I know your families are, are all affected by this too, just like all of ours are. I'm really glad, we're really lucky to have you there. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ryan or Jeff, I, I think I'm turning over to, to Jeff now. Thank you.